Hello, everybody. This is Stuff I Find Interesting. I am your host, Laura, and that song um, actually has a story behind it. It's the reason why I was adopted. And you might be saying, All right, Laura, why is that song the reason why you were adopted? Well, I'll tell you why. A member of this band was married to a woman named Judy. And they lived in Greenwich Village, had a cute little fun life, did concerts and shows and traveled around and went to Iran and, well, they broke up and she met Jim. Judy and Jim became my adoptive parents. So if she had never met these guys, this particular guy, who she met through the music in Greenwich Village, sparked her interest. She said, "Who? who's that? That handsome guy. Then, who knows? Who knows what would happen? Maybe somebody else would have adopted me. I don't think so. Kind of a handful. All right, so, have you not touched the fruitcake that your grandmother made you? Well, fret not, because an untouched century-year-old fruitcake was just found in Antarctica of all places and not even the starving penguins touched it that's how bad it that's how bad it was so if you haven't eaten the fruitcake don't feel bad you can bring the story up it'll be in the links you can say Nana look not even the penguins will eat the fruitcake let's talk next about Macanda Illinois. Macanda, Macanda, yeah, that's how you say it, Macanda. Macanda, Illinois is a town with a population of 547. It was 561. It has since gone down. Now, this particular town is known as the Star of Egypt. Interesting, right? Let's talk about Macanda a little bit more. Let's, what's going on in Macanda? We have the prehistoric Macanda Stone Fort. So there are these east-west forts that are built that they were probably built by the Hopewellian Indians, but they're not really sure. But they're saying, gosh, these people only had primitive equipment to dig and to move stuff. So how did they do this exactly? And sometimes there's rocks that are piled across summits, leaving inside enclosures sometimes as large as 50 acres, depending on the size of the bluff. Now, I personally think that these particular stone walls <clears throat> that were created by the Indians were made for the purposes of hunting. You know, you would, you know, you would tactically ride in different directions and you would sort of guide your, your, your prey, you know, through the walls into the area where you could then, you could then capture it. It was six feet high and nine feet thick, so it was pretty big. Okay, well, you know what, that's, that's pretty interesting. Let's keep looking. Well, actually, just a quick little, I started thinking about Illinois towns that were named for Indian chiefs because Macanda is actually named for an Indian chief, they think, they're not really sure, but there's a whole bunch of them, look, Bigfoot, Half Day, Marseille, Mendota, Paw Paw. Peoria, Seneca, Shabona, Wapella, the list goes on and on. So just even though the Native Americans might have come and gone from that area and moved to another area, their names live on. So let's get back to this. So, so we've got this place, Macanda. We've got these prehistoric stone forts. Um, we've got all these towns named after Indians in this particular area. Okay, let's add some more into the mix. Why is Southern Illinois referred to as Little Egypt? 
I've noticed that a lot of towns dotting southern Illinois have incredibly foreign names compared to the surrounding town. Thebes, Cairo, Karnak. Why is that? And someone steps in and says, the origins of the term Little Egypt are somewhat clouded. Of course they are. But as someone who lives in the area, I will try my best to answer them. So there are a couple of explanations here. I'm not going to go through all of it. One of them is that there was a guy, he's walking around, and he comes across the town, and he says, oh my God, this is biblical. This is like, you know, back in biblical Egypt times, and so he named things after Egypt. Another guess is that it was thought that if the towns were given, like, exotic names, that people might want to move there. They'd say, oh, wow, yeah, I want to move to Cairo, Illinois. That sounds like a great place to go. So, not really sure. A variety of reasons. Uh, actually, there's a third reason, I forgot about that, and that is because this particular area is rich in agriculture and uh, provided food relief to the rest of the state in times of need, much like Egypt was the breadbasket of Mesopotamia. Now, before we go to the Smithsonian, <clears throat> I just want to go over some maps. Okay, we've got... Um, what was I doing here? Oh, here we go. We've got Pyramid State Park. We've got Egyptian asphalt and seal coating. Interesting. We've already did Pyramid. There it is again, in case you forgot. Little Egypt Off-Road Motorcycle Club. Okay. Egyptian Hills, Egyptian Hills Resort, Egyptian Lake Escape, Bethlehem Church. That's not too unusual. Dam Near Lake of Egyptian Egypt cabins dam near Lake of Egypt cabins uh, Pyramid Acres Marina Lake of Egypt Road Mount Moriah what else have we got Heil Farms Haunting in Little Egypt Little Grand Canyon now this is where we're gonna stop for a second the distance between Macanda Illinois and Grand Canyon, Arizona, is this. <laughs> However far that is. That's pretty far, right? So there's an area called the Little Grand Canyon. Now let's zoom in and see how Grand Canyon-ish it is. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely say that that's that's a little that's a little Grand Canyon because if we go here and we look, right? I mean much different geologically not even in the same not even in the same category so Macanda Illinois has Egyptian names and it also has a Grand Canyon now why do I bring that up why do I bring up the Grand Canyon connection because it is thought and in I'm gonna leave this link up here so you can watch it but there are a lot of places uh, actually most of the main places that were discovered originally well rediscovered by early explorers the Grand Canyon they named different places like promontories different plateaus that ridge that ridge they named them after Egyptian names so why did they randomly do that why did these explorers randomly name the Grand Canyon Arizona after Egypt names so if we go back to the three reasons for Macanda being named after Egyptian names it doesn't quite fit so interesting to think about. Let's talk a little bit more about, about this particular area and the fact that there are pyramids here, like actual pyramids. And you can go there. Getting there is very easy. This will be in the links. If you live nearby, you can go check it out. This is the Mississippian culture. It says they lasted from around 1000 to 1500 AD, but there has been recent discoveries that might push that needle back but those discoveries are not yet accepted. East St. Louis, Illinois used to be an ancient city with pyramids. An ancient city with pyramids. 30,000 people. 30,000 people. Now that's like the whole area, so that would in also include the area that is now Macanda. But my point is that Macanda, which now has a population of 541 people, used to have at least a couple thousand people that live there, including pyramids, including towns that are named after Egypt. And this 
talks a little bit more about the Grand Canyon artifacts. If you say, wow, that's really interesting. I want to know more about that. You can, you can go ahead and, and you, can, you can check that out. So we started right off with some conspiracies, but I think that that is, um, I think it's intriguing, no? The fact that, that, uh, that all these names were named after Egypt. Uh, okay, so now there have been a lot of discoveries recently in archaeology. I don't know why I've been on an archaeology archaeological kick, but I have. I've just been fascinated by the world. It's the world has just been very interesting to me lately. Um, like the runes, though, <laughs> not like the people, modern society, politics. Oh, well, there we go. That's why I'm interested in it. Aerial survey identifies oldest, largest Maya structure ever found in Mexico. The platform stands between 33 and 50 feet tall and measures almost a mile long. Let me say that again. The platform stands between 33 and 50 feet tall and measures almost a mile long. This was built by the Mayans. Built between 1000 and 800 BC, so a long while Long, long time ago, before Christ. Why? Why did they do this? And if we look at it overhead, we can see it's very unassuming. It doesn't look like much, but through the LIDAR, they were able to determine... Oh, this is silly. Hang on a second. This site is pure cancer. So what I'm doing now, in case you're wondering, is there's this wonderful site called 12foot.io. And you put in the site that you want to see, and it gives you a cleaner version of that page. You're still going to get crap, but if you have one that's just, I mean, just wall-to-wall -wall ads. Um, lately, I've I put on a little bit of weight, and so I've been looking at clothes. So there are a lot of ads all over that page that are clothes, which you don't necessarily need to see. You don't need to see me shopping for my old lady, middle-aged clothes, mom pants, whatever. <laughs> Hundreds of ancient ceremonial sites hidden under Mexico reveal how the Mayans adopted a mysterious design trait from the older Olmec civilization more than 3,000 years ago. So this is where it gets interesting. Not only have we discovered this site, but we've discovered that it might actually be inspired by an even older site that was created by the Olmecs, who we know very little about, who we probably should know more about, um, but we don't necessarily. So this particular area, um, very unusual that you would see something like this. In fact, if we look around, we can see all these trees that are cut down. That's why you can see that. You can see that because someone was in that area and said, oh, wait, here, there's a structure here, and cut down all this brush. And I believe there's a pyramid thingy under there. But it shows you how labor-intensive it is to uncover uncover something. Very early Maya ceremonial architecture at Ch Chebal, Chebal. Here we have the layers, and you can see it goes down, down, down. They found ceremonial bi buildings and civic space. So when, as soon as you find a village, town, city, whatever, with civic space, that tells you that the people are comfortable enough that they can begin talking about, okay, how are we going to govern? Uh, what kind of roads are we going to have? What, what, um, what holidays are we going to celebrate? then you know that this is a society that is comfortable. This is a society that has trade, that has uh, goods, that has money, um, that has uh, infrastructure, connections to other societies. This is actually pretty exciting stuff. The historic Olmec city of San Lorenzo. So this Mayan thing got me thinking about the Olmec thing. The Olmec culture thrived along Mexico's Gulf Coast from roughly 1200 BC to 400 BC. Actually, it might be further back. One of the most important archaeological sites is San Lorenzo. It's located in the Veracruz state, about 38 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And this goes into the stonework and the sculpture and the politics and the decline. And the decline is much like many other great civilizations. Like suddenly they just weren't there and we're not 100% sure why. And of course, 
I cannot see this because it's the times. What is this? Um, mother culture or only a sister? Olmec Maya. Let's see if that brings something up. Here we go. Olmecs weren't purely a mother nor a sister to other Mesoamerican cultures, but the hallmarks of the Olmec iconography were developed within the Olmec heartland and that this iconography became in the worlds of Michael Coe an all-pervading art style throughout Mesoamerica. Here we have an aqueduct that was made by the Olmecs which shows again they were very comfortable they were they were making waterworks so they were comfortable enough to put down roots build structures very complex structures honor their dead build aqueducts many of which are still here today in fact i think there are three working aqueducts in the world that are before the birth of christ and i think this might be one of them there it is one of three ancient american hydraulic structures still working today it doesn't look like much but the way that it is built out of rocks and earth and mud, it, uh, it creates a hydraulic system so that water can be controlled and contained, uh, used for farming, used for drinking, whatever else it is that people, that people do. This is just some eye candy for you to look at. This is someone's trip to this particular area, and I like to include things that match up with what I'm saying so that you can have like you can have visual aids but I'm not going to read all about uh, Jim and Carol's Mexico adventure you I'll let, I'll let you guys do that it seems like they had a nice time so here's some more information about the aqueduct is this the aqueduct or a different aqueduct this is a different aqueduct but during the same time period And despite never having use of bronze, iron, or steel tools and minimal use of the wheel, the Aztecs developed into some of the most skilled civil engineer, engineers in the world over a two century period. So we were talking about Mayas and we we're talking about Aztecs. So this area very well built up. In fact, if we keep going all the way up to Illinois and we go back to Makanda, lots of stuff happening there as well. I found out something new this week, last week, some week, a couple weeks ago. Happy New Year, by the way. And that is that Australia didn't always look the way, the way we think of. So here we have Australia. Australia used to have kind of like a little top to it. And that was known as the continent of Sahul. So the continent of Sahul connected to Mexico. And there was probably a whole lot of civilization going on in that area it is almost impossible to imagine the worlds we now know as maritime south asia and australia as they were 50,000 years ago that seems like a long time but it's really not 50,000 years ago is not a long time so 50,000 years ago people were running around in this particular area and then eventually forced kind of to, to move in now there's still a very shallow area through here known as the Torres Strait which is in general no more than 50 feet deep even though it's kind of in the kind of in the ocean it's not it's not very deep this is one of the one of the animals that probably ran around that particular area i think they're still working out what was there and doing studies and i would imagine they're probably doing core drilling which is where they drill into the ground and they pull out a core sample and then they study the different layers and what kind of plants and animals and stuff was in there so they're still studying but what this shows is that people were way more mobile and moving around to different areas um, across a longer period of time. In other words, there's this, this like when I was in school, I remember thinking, I remember hearing about how everybody moved and it was like this mass migration and it made it sound like everybody kind of left Africa at the same time and went to other places and it wasn't quite like that. There were waves of migration, much like there are waves of migration today. You see different people migrating for different reasons. When I worked as an ESL uh, tutor, trainer, instructor, whatever you want to call me, I noticed that the people that were coming in changed from year to year, depending on what was going on in the world. When I first started, there were a lot of Asian Americans, specifically Chinese, coming over. This would have been uh, in the mid, 
like this would have been like 2013. And by the time I left that job, there weren't a lot more Chinese. Alexandra David Neal, an absolutely fascinating woman that I learned about this week. I'm not going to go too deep in with her, but she, she went trotting around Tibet. And she was, her teachings influenced the beat writers Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. She also influenced Alan Watts and Ram Dass and the esotericist Benjamin Cream, who I've actually never heard of. I don't know who that is. Let's look up that guy. So she was an opera singer and she got married. And she didn't want children and she was like "Ah, I don't know if marriage is really for me so she kind of went on a singing tour but it was kind of incompatible with her need of independence and inclination to education so she promised to return to her husband and she said I'm gonna go travel I need to go travel but here's the here's the part that that really gets me (laughs) it was 14 years later (laughs) when she finally came back to him 14 years 14 years. Here's a little bit about her absolutely fascinating, fascinating life. Let's, let's save this guy. Save it for another time. We'll see who this guy is. I'm sure he has something fascinating to say. Sahul, uh, I think I had this in the wrong order. We're done with Sahul. We're moving on anyway. This is a page called the extinctions and it talks about just like I said how there's rise and fall of civilizations and animals and stuff rewriting history Australia's oldest known campsite this is another going back to Australia did I what did I do here Hmm. I think I had a lot more to say about Sahul and I kind of like messed that whole thing up so Go ahead, go ahead, read about Sahul, because we're moving on. Fossilized footprints in white sands. This is in the United States, and there was White Sands National Park. They found footprints of elephants, or mammoths rather, and teenagers who were kind of hanging out, and their footprints indicate sort of leisurely walking around. They weren't running, they weren't marching, they were just sort of meandering probably watching probably watching the the mammoths which is why they have this picture here saving the apple ancient ancestor in the forest of Kazakhstan now one of the things we don't think about very often I think is that one of the things that has enabled us to feed more people in the world is that we've genetically modified crops which is a lot of people get all conspiracied up about it and yeah there there are conspiracies about it but it allows more people to be fed right because the population keeps growing if we were a, a, a society with any common sense at all we would we would we would chill that the heck out but you know capitalism anyhow the apple has come to sort of a dead end in terms of its dna because it's been modified so many times and there's all these other apples out there that have that have come and gone that no longer exist there's an ancient apple in Kazakhstan in the Tian Shan mountains that they're hoping can be used to help put back a little bit of that wild DNA back into the modern apple and thus set it free from the dead end that it has found itself in moving on we are trucking along this is Varanasi Varanasi is a place that sad that that like absolutely fascinates me so in Varanasi they were like you know what we need to build this road that goes from the sea into through the town and I forget how it was but everything in this town is so old that everything's very circuitous so getting from one point to another gets complicated there's a port in order to get goods from the port to the places that it needs to be if there were roads that went straight through it would be much easier this was the idea they started clearing and they found things like this and this and this this 
So these are ruins within ruins. So there were old, vacant, dilapidated structures. And when they knocked them down or started to take them apart, they discovered that they hid temples. I think I read that there were 72 so far that they've discovered, but that amount is not confirmed because there's a lot of, there's a lot of weirdness with this story. I think it probably has to do with the fact that it would be profitable to have a road through there. So maybe they're trying to figure out how they can preserve some of the structure, but also have a road at the same time. I'm totally riffing. I have no idea, but that's, that's what I would do. Takakia survived the upheaval of early earth, but it may soon go extinct. This is very sad. The world's oldest moss. It exists in the roof of the world. It grows in the Himalaya mountains on the uh, highest and largest plateaus. It's very tiny. It's slow growing. It can also be found in parts of Japan and the United States, the very high, high areas. So this moss is dying because of climate change. I always talk about climate change every time I do one of these, and, and I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but things are changing, and we need to change along with it. This is some more about, about the 390-year-old moss. 390 million years old. Here's the identification. This is the scientific article about it. It's related to mugwort, if you know what mugwort is, which means it probably has some, some types of medicinal, medicinal um, properties, I would think. If you hear yelling, it's because my neighbor is playing Call of Duty or a basketball video game right now, and it sounds like things are not going well for him. So if you hear yelling, there's no emergency, just, just my neighbor being very excited about this video game. Speaking of video games, Portal Revolution came out this week. That is a free mod for Portal 2, which is a game where you solve puzzles, you create portals to travel around to do stuff. And there's this guy who's been working on a mod for, oh God, at least five years. It, I think it's longer than that. But he's worked on this, like with a with a small group of people just dedicated just just working on it working on it working on it and who released the mod this week for free so i've been playing that and having a good time this is a cool picture that i found this is the quiet days and it is by rick amore who is an australian we've been talking about australia and we just mentioned the mammoths this sort of ties all that together while i was at british prince we're segueing on we're moving out of this I found a picture of this great guy. This is Gottfried Schlacken. Look at this dude. This dude was definitely getting the ladies. There's no doubt about that. Like he's got the light, the illumination. What else do we have here? We have the, the fallen statues, the nod to knowledge and philosophy. and So that's quite a wig too. I have no idea who he is. I haven't I haven't looked that up. Maybe I should look that up. Let's let's add him to the other thing. We'll go back. We'll check him out another time. I just thought he was very fetching. I said that guy's very fetching. Science Daily is a place I like to go to find different science news. Let's look at quirky news. What have we got? Top news. Top quirky news. New images reveal what Neptune and Uranus really look like. Mystery, mysterious missing component in the clouds of Venus revealed. The snail or the egg. Engineers invent octopus-inspired technology that can deceive and signal. So we're using the octopuses to... We were talking about octopuses last time. They have inspired us to... For camouflage purposes you know like what's going on in their skin what's happening can we replicate that scientifically i learned about clapper bridges too recently a clapper bridge is a bridge with a bunch of flat pieces of rock and then there's rock underneath the flat pieces of rock to support it it sounds very simple and and it is very simple 
It's also extremely long lasting when done correctly. This is a clapper bridge in Sussex, but they are not limited to, to that particular area of the world. There's also <clears throat> some clapper bridges in India, I believe. Here's another clapper bridge. I was hoping there was more pictures in there, but there's not. This is a news, news home. I guess I didn't have any more pictures. Ancient Beat is another place I like to go. I like to go to Science Daily. I like to go to Ancient Beat to read and, and geek out about archaeology. Let's pick a random thing here. This looks like, what is this? What have we got going on here? Um, is this it? No. I'm looking for this picture. This one right here. The Devil's Church. Let's look that up. Piran Kirko. Piran Kirko. Where do we think this place is? It's in Finland of all places. I never would have guessed that. I guess it has some acoustic, acoustic mysteries. I missed that the first time around. I guess we need to add that to that too. See what I mean about the clothes? I'm done with you. If you ever go to Azerbaijan, which you will probably not, but if you do, you can check out the Azerbaijan Carpet Museum. The museum was called the Azerbaijan State Museum of Carpet and a Folk Applied Arts from 1993 to 2014. And then it was the State Museum of Carpet and Applied Arts. And then it was the Azerbaijan Carpet Museum. And now it's the Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum. It is the only museum that's dedicated to the work of, of rugs in this particular area. This has <clears throat> some pictures of rugs. We don't think about rugs too often as being works of art, but, but they really are. This is the museum, made to look sort of like a rolled up rug. Kind of cool, right? This is the back side of the museum, which looks conventional. Isaac Bentoff, Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness. I just thought this was a really cool read. It'll be in the links for you to check out. Uh, this guy, I think I've brought him up before. I think there was a video I shared. But he really goes into how there's more than what we see and what we perceive and what we experience. There's this whole other, right? How far does that other go? Who created the other? These are questions that none of us know. But he explores these things. He explores the, the double slit experiment. Like he relates it back to quantum physics. He, he is scientifically grounded, even though he tends to sort of fly, uh, fly about. He talks about sound waves and vibration. Light is both a wave and a particle at the same time. So for you, the long gom runners. I used to run. I used to run a lot. And after about, even when I was at my most fittest, after about seven miles, that was it. I would fade. I was, I was pretty much, pretty much done. Longom, and it predates the arrival of Buddhism in Tibet. And what it is, is it's gathering energy and learning how to use this energy for various things. For example, sitting in a snowbank and melting all the snow while naked or running for days and days and days and days. Belief in such a training and its efficacy has existed for many years in Tibet and men who traveled with supernormal rapidity are mentioned in many traditions. We read in Miller Spa's biography that at the house of the Lama who taught him black magic, there lived a monk who was fleeter than a horse. He ascribes his gift to the clever control of internal air. So Longompa, it's a style of running where they sort of run and leap at the same time. 
One of my servants suggested that, that he might belong to a trader's caravan which had been attacked by robbers and disbanded. Uh, I didn't say the segue, so I apologize for that. Perhaps having fled for his life at night or otherwise escaped, he was now lost in the desert. That seemed possible, but as I continued to observe him through the glasses, I noticed that the man proceeded at an unusual gait and with an extraordinary swiftness. Though with their naked eyes, my men could hardly see anything but a black speck moving over the grassy ground, they too were not long in remarking in the quickness of its advance. I handed them the glasses, and one of them, having observed the traveler for a while, muttered, it looks like Lama Longompa. So Lama Longompa, it's the ability to run where you're lifting yourself up from the ground and it's preceded by leaps. Um, hang on just a second. They train with chains, they go into dark rooms, they meditate. So, some initiates in the secret lore assert that, as a result of long years of practice, after he has traveled over a certain distance, the feet of the Long Gompa no longer touch the ground, and that he glides on the air with extreme celerity. True or not true? Probably an element of truth. Now, my name is 398 in Gematria. Gematria is basically new I don't want to say basically numerology it's more complicated than that it's a type of numerology it's like spiritual religious numerology well remember I told you a couple of weeks ago I was messing around with tarot cards and I pulled a devil card well <laughs> Satan's name in Gematria is the same as mine so there you have it me and Satan related this is a we're heading into conspiracy land battle doc top secret with orcon the world is divided into three classes of people very small group of people that makes things happen a somewhat larger group that watches things happen and the great multitude of who never knows what happened now the reason why i share this document is because i just really have no idea what is going on there's discussions of gravity Werner Braun, Werner von Braun is in here, the rocket dude. We've got uh, Carnegie's mentioned. What is this? <clears throat> it's just so crazy. A craft found in Aztec, New Mexico. Maybe those long platforms were actually runways for spaceships, right? This is just something to poke through because it's really, really wild and out there. And it's like it takes 25 different conspiracies and sort of weaves them all together in this one, this one document. It's really quite crazy. Now, I don't know if you guys hang out on social media, but there's a rumor that Disclosure, specifically UAP Disclosure, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, is going to be discussed in 2024. 2024 and onward are going to be big years for it. Now they're talking about controlled versus catastrophic disclosure. There was recently a bill in Congress where things were going to be disclosed, not necessarily aliens, just we've discovered these things. We don't know what they are or what they do, but we've discovered them. And as a result, we've been able to enrich our aeronautics, our whatever so the rich people that control stuff said oh no 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 we can't we can't have this disclosure because we're using this technology and we're really not supposed to do that uh, and get a monopoly over everything so the so we, we we really can't we can't talk about that so the the bill got knocked down so there's not going to be official disclosure but what there are discussions about now is that if there are aliens interdimensional creature if there's something out there and it gets disclosed by somebody else, like another country, that's when it becomes catastrophic because the United States no longer has control over the narrative, which could be very bad for the people of the United States. As you know, half of us are not very bright. And 
who knows what could happen people could go uh, completely crazy there are more than 10 whistleblowers like david grush david grush is this guy he was on joe rogan he used to work for the government he worked in departments which would have brought him into contact with this type of technology if it existed and he's now he's now a whistleblower this is for you to read and it starts to veer out into left field pretty quickly but the reality is the fact of the matter is that there was going to be a bill that was going to release information previously not known to the public regarding UAP phenomena and it was shot down oh this talks about the battle doc top secret with Orcon so here are people that might know more stuff about it talk about it I probably added that on as an as an afterthought now you guys know I'm obsessed with dream worlds this is a map of somebody's dream world and I have to tell you that my map is pretty similar there's a whole page of people they draw their dream their dream worlds what they look like the people that go to the same places night after night after night and they all have these similarities it's quite shocking actually but I, th I thought that this was a neat thing that this person took the time to draw this out looks like acrylic pen that was very well done good job bobbing forest by Jorge Baker Baker Jorge Baker floating forest this is a I think now we're heading into pictures picture land <laughs> I was having a rough day last week and I came across this picture and I instantly felt better Mr. raccoon chilling so this person says that they uh, this guy was coming on my deck every night and taking about an hour nap so we put a blanket where he kept napping and this happened very cute raccoons looks like he's quite comfortable the book of miracles is a late medieval early renaissance document that is the subject of much discussion because the pictures that are in it are the pictures true like is this a real thing or is this man did I download this maybe I did download this hang on I think I might have actually downloaded this already look at me with my fancy fancy schmancy Mm, downloads we've got yoga exercises no we got slow down no PDF no no oh here it is I did save it <gasps> amazing so there are all these crazy pictures that someone put in here this is clearly a comet they saw a comet this is how they created it so there are things that they saw and they created but then there are things like this was there actually a many-headed thing running around this looks like it represents an earthquake of some kind two lions fighting in the sky so segueing from the UAP phenomena there are some websites where they talk about how the book of miracles might possibly show UAP phenomena so it's fascinating I think it's fascinating to think about all right Alphonse Mucha in the Gilded Age America. This is for this is eye candy for you guys to freak out about and have fun with. If we go down here to the bottom, you can see we have like pretty much not his whole catalog because he did a lot of stuff, but some things that you might not necessarily see because Mucha's stuff is done to death, right? It's put on calendars. You can buy like T-shirts with it on it. 
but he was a real artist in his own right. It was quite talented. I mean, if we look at this, I feel like he captured this guy's expression. Like this guy's like, yeah, and very arrogant. And look at this. Oh wait, this is John Singer Sargent. This isn't Mucha. Who is this? Holy cow, I'm an idiot. That is Mucha, but this is John Singer Sargent. There's a reason why they showed that. I think they showed that because he was a contemporary and their styles in some ways were similar in that their, pa their paintings were very expressive. We're going to finish off by looking at a artist that I found this week that I thought was wonderful. This is Agnes Pelton. And this song is Character by Sakura. Here's Agnes looking delighted holding an apple. Maybe it's from Kazakhstan. So you might look at this and be like, oh, it's kind of like Georgia O'Keeffe. And it is kind of like Georgia O'Keeffe. It's also like Hilda, uh, Hilda AF. I always want to say Hilda as fuck, but I know that's not her, her name. Um, I'm talking about this person. Clint. Hilma AF Klimt. See her stuff. Now if we go back. Same but different. This is called Ecstasy. Mountains. Her art is proof that you don't have to draw something exactly 100% in order for it to be art, right? Like, there's all kinds of things you could do with shape, with color, with textures to create something that's wonderful to look at. So we're going to finish with Ami and Egypt. So today's theme seems to be Egyptian. That seems to be the theme today. Egyptian. So we've come to the end of the episode. I hope everybody has a wonderful week and a happy new year. This is episode 48. Uh, let's see if we can get to episode 50 at some point. Um, I think that would be cool. Um, maybe for the 50th episode, I'll actually make like a real effort and up my production quality. Or maybe not. I don't know. You guys love me the way I am anyway, right? Of course you do. Have a great week.